megawatts of storage deployed last year here in the United States. Energy storage is not just about the foundation for a more modern, clean, and reliable energy system, but is also a key sector for American geoeconomic leadership. However, as we will hear today, the international landscape is highly competitive, and the United States will need to do more to support battery innovation if it is to maintain an edge into the future. Finally, I'd like to remind everyone and take the opportunity to flag for those of you already not aware that later this afternoon, at the end of the day, around 5 p.m., we will be hosting another terrific public event with Patrick Puyanet, Chairman and CEO of Total. Please do consider sticking around for that event. We'll have wine. As Mr. Puyanet will be discussing strategy amid the low-carbon transition, and I'm sure energy storage will pop up in that discussion as well. And so, without further ado, let me welcome to the stage Akshat Rathi, for a short scene setting presentation before our panel kicks off. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Um, I'm going to keep this presentation short. Presentations, are ten they tend to be boring. I'm going to make this exciting. There are very few words on it, mostly pictures. Um, and I'm doing this in some way because of my editor. When I proposed to him that uh, we should do a series on batteries, his first question was, aren't they kind of boring? And this is trying to prove that they are not boring. Um, so three questions to answer today. Why, do, why should we care about energy storage? Uh, how do we get to the future that energy storage can make possible or has already made possible in some cases? And who are the companies or the people that can get us there? Uh, we are living through, uh, we've lived through one exponential uh, technology curve in, in the silicon chip industry. We are living through another one in the battery industry. Um, exponential technologies are uh, those that disrupt because we don't understand how to tackle them. Uh, people uh, and companies don't understand how to make sure that they stay ahead of the curve rather than catching up. And uh, so batteries are a technology story. Uh, they're also a geopolitics story. This is uh, CATL, which is the world's largest uh, lithium-ion battery company. Uh, eight years ago, that was barren land. Uh, and now that's a $30 billion uh, company making batteries for name a car brand in the world, and CATL uh, will count them as their customer. Uh, it's also an environment story. Uh, David touched upon the fact that we'll need uh, batteries for uh, integrating renewable energy, but we'll also need batteries to clear up air pollution. That's Delhi. Uh, my wife grew up in Delhi, and she says she misses the fact that uh, they used to sleep on the terrace, wake up to a blue sky and chirping birds, and now this is what, to, what they have to uh, deal with pretty much every winter. And of course, batteries are not new. The first battery that was invented was 1799. Uh, if anything, batteries are the reason we have electricity. They were the first source of stable electricity um, um, in, in history. And so, uh, you know, every car uh, that's there in the world, almost every car has a lead acid battery that was invented in 1859. We've had batteries for a very long time, but there is a curve there of the lithium ion in, uh, batteries, which has made batteries uh, such an interesting topic today. And that's because lithium ion batteries are able to do something that previous batteries weren't able to do. They are, uh, they are energy dense, which means you can have lots of energy in a small space and put them in a smartphone. And they, they have a high power capacity, which is that you can withdraw lots of energy in very short time. That means you can put them in electric cars or eventually electric planes. Uh, and that uh, uh, curve, alongside that curve, is the other side, which is they are now becoming uh, more uh, ubiquitous because of the fact that their prices are falling. And this curve will continue to fall for quite some time to come. Uh, I, this is the only technical slide, and I want to bring in a little bit of the technology side because uh, batteries are one side a very hyped industry because of all the potential that we talked about. But there, there is hype because it's poorly understood, and that's because most people don't know what's inside a battery. Uh, our experts today will touch upon those, and I wanted to give you uh, just a, a brief insight into what a battery is. A battery typically has these components. There are two electrodes, the cathode and the anode. 
uh, there is, uh, uh, and the, between the electrodes, you'll have a pa charged particle that'll go back and forth. So when you're charging it, it'll go from one electrode to the other. When you're using it, it'll go from uh, that electrode to, uh, back to the electrode where uh, it was previously. And that happens through an electrolyte. Uh, and that is what a battery is. But uh, the materials that make up uh, cathode and anode have changed drastically. And that's what made, uh, that's what made lithium ion batteries so interesting. Uh, we'll touch upon the fact that a lot of the uh, batteries that we use today use critical minerals like cobalt, and what's the future of uh, using batteries that have such a critical mineral in it. Uh, but I, I, I hope you keep this picture in mind when we are talking about uh, batteries and, and uh, what's happening inside them. Of course, if all that plays out well, the future is really bright. You might get electric planes, you'll have the mass market electric cars, which are sort of becoming uh, uh, a reality already in China, and you'll get maybe even 100% renewable energy. Perhaps not with just lithium ion batteries, but other types of energy storage technologies. The companies that can get us there, these are the big players. Uh, Panasonic, CATL, LG Chem, BYD. Panasonic is Japanese, known here in America because of its partnership with Tesla. LG Chem is South Korean. But two of those are Chinese, CATL and BYD. China right now makes the most, um, uh, most amount of batteries in the world and will continue to do for decades to come because the government has considered it to be a strategic technology to invest in. Of course, they're not the only companies. There's a lot of investments going in startups. Uh, America still leads the world, even though China has the capacity, America leads the world in battery innovation. Um, one of, uh, um, one of America's, uh, one, uh, an American startup has now become uh, the first unicorn being a billion dollar um, uh, startup uh, because of the amount of interest in this field. Um, and I, before we go to the panel, I just wanted to say that much of this comes from uh, guides that we are writing at Quartz. Uh, so in December, we published one on electric cars. Uh, in April was one on batteries. Uh, and I'm currently working on one about the future of the electric grid. Uh, I'll ho I hope you can check that out. And uh, I run a newsletter, which is becoming a weekly uh, at the end of this month. So I hope you'll sign up. Uh, and with that, I'd like to uh, get our panelists uh, and get our discussion about batteries uh, into much more detail. Um, you all have probably read their bios, but uh, just briefly, so you have uh, some context. Uh, we have Mitali Gupta from uh, uh, Wood McKinsey and uh, Venkat Viswanathan, who's an uh, assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, they've also been uh, integral in my uh, reporting on batteries, and they've helped me understand this landscape better. Uh, so I wanted to start with, uh, uh, with Venkat uh, and get your thoughts on what do you think are uh, the bottlenecks uh, right now in battery innovation that are holding back some of the uh, big uh, useful uh, applications that uh, may be coming in the future? Yeah, so um, battery innovation uh, requires materials and, and doing anything with materials is really hard. Um, and if you look at the sort of trajectory of any materials innovation from conception in the lab to something that you would use, uh, the rough ballpark time is 20 years. Uh, and um, most um, companies run out of money, and uh, um, that leaves many, many great ideas, um, either in the patent literature or uh, even worse, uh, in drawers of uh, companies bankrupt. So uh, I think that's the hardest part about battery innovation, uh, which is chemistry, materials, and uh, handling chemistry and materials is very hard. So uh, I think that's one of the big challenges uh, with respect to taking battery innovation and, and putting that into a product. Yeah, and I want to say that I want this to be a conversation. Uh, and so whenever you feel like you have a question, raise your hand. I'll, I'll keep looking out for hands. Uh, Otherwise, uh, you know, don't feel shy. This is this is very much uh, batteries are one of those topics which, uh, you know, seem uh, big and important. But we want us to get into the nitty gritties and really grapple with what the technology can do. Middle um, tell me a little bit more about some of the material constraints. So there's the innovation part, right. but uh, batteries are also, as we know, 
uh, highly dependent on use of cobalt, on exactly. lithium, exactly. Uh, and what's the what's the you know the current landscape of how these yeah. critical minerals are playing out? Absolutely. Um, so when we say lithium-ion batteries, um, it's a whole family of different kinds of batteries that come under a lithium-ion battery. So there are different kinds of chemistries that exist within the lithium-ion family. Um, the more common chemistry which nowadays is being used for EVs and now more so for energy storage is nickel manganese cobalt oxide batteries. Um, so it's basically your nickel manganese cobalt with some lithium on the cathode side of things. And then you have your anode which is made up of graphite um, in most cases. So because um, metals like um, cobalt are being used in these batteries, um, these metals are um, currently being derived from places like Congo, where we already have a lot of geopolitical issues going on. Um, so there isn't enough supply um, which can kind of meet the growing demand that you know we are forecasting in the future, both for EVs as well as for energy storage industry. Uh, but not to say the industry is not looking you know, to figure out ways how we can kind of go towards a low cobalt future. Um, so the industry is now looking at batteries uh, where we can actually reduce the cobalt content in cathodes and build high nickel cathodes. Um, so uh, most uh, historically, the, the market that we had had chemistries, um, NMC again, nickel manganese cobalt batteries with a one 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 ratio, so equal parts of nickel, equal parts of manganese, equal parts of cobalt. But now the industry is moving towards um, six to two, which is six parts of nickel to two parts of cobalt. Um, there are also innovations happening around building um, eight one one, which is eight parts of nickel to one part of cobalt. So vendors are you know really trying hard to bring down cobalt content in batteries, uh, which is obviously going to help them safeguard um, from the risks of you know, supply constraints that might occur um, because we just have limited supply. Right now, again, most of it is concentrated in Congo, um, but also is going to help um, bring down pricing. Um, so to kind of touch upon what happened um, last couple of years, um, just as the market saw this huge demand of batteries for EVs and for energy storage, and the market started anticipating that you know we're going to need a lot more batteries, cobalt prices actually started um, ramping up pretty quickly last year. Early last year, we saw uh, prices more than double pretty pretty quickly, um, and there just wasn't enough you know availability in the market. Um, as a result of that, a lot of um, innovations um, were sort of um, made by companies where they started, you know, rolling out chemistries where they uh, were playing around with increasing nickel content and you know reducing cobalt content in batteries. That, however, is not easy, right? You've, uh, we, you yeah. know, you and I have talked about cobalt a lot because cobalt is critical for how the chemistry works, yeah. and so, what just what does it take to reduce cobalt in a battery? So uh, I think in the spirit of, uh, of how Akshat started to make batteries not boring, um, I'm going to try and describe this with an analogy um, with this whole nickel manganese cobalt game. Um, nickel is like the Lamborghini. Um, it, that's what's giving you the energy. It's packing a punch um, and giving you um, all of the things you want. Um, uh, manganese is sort of the, you know, the cheap uh, mass market Toyota uh, that's, you know, uh, adding um, sufficient with sufficient uh, sort of capacity on the road. Um, the cobalt is really the cop car. Uh, cobalt ensures that all of these people are going to be disciplined, uh, that the nickel doesn't somehow move from one lane to another, uh, and, and 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 so on, right? So um, really, the challenge uh, is how do you keep this society in an ordered way without the cobalt, right? So that's really. Cobalt's actually not uh, the energy producing component in a nickel manganese cobalt um, oxide material, um, but it's really the one that brings order to that material. And, and that's what uh, makes uh, the material cycle uh, for a very long period of time. So uh, people are thinking very, very hard about uh, but not having cobalt as the cop car. Um, there are many other, um, many other options. The, the tricky thing is um, that uh, most other um, possible options uh, don't quite uh, give the same level of performance as cobalt. Uh, I think that's the real hard thing because you want everything uh, that you already have and more, right? So you, you can't sacrifice anything. And, and so that's the hard part. So uh, there's a lot of effort in DOE uh, towards low cobalt. Um, there's, a very, there's a very large program uh, a couple of years ago uh, from the uh, ERE division um, supporting ultra low cobalt, ultra low and no cobalt. Uh, it's a hard problem, but I think many are working on it. There are some options out there. Uh, 
Camex Power uh, has, um, has come up with a, a family of materials broadly called ELNO, uh, which is largely nickel oxide. Um, I think there's, there's promise, but there's still a long way to go before they're going to be prime time. <laughs> Yeah, and the other thing about batteries is that uh, you know we, we can talk about the the minerals are are one part, but there are properties within the batteries that need to be uh, tackled as well. So uh, we talked about how they are energy dense, so they can pack in a lot more energy. The more nickel you have, for example, you'll have more energy. But when you start packing in more energy, they start becoming less safe. Uh, and there has been there have been a number of of uh, you know fire incidents, you've probably come, uh, come across uh, stories of how a Tesla car, when it burns, it burns unlike a, a, an internal combustion engine car. That shouldn't be surprising. They're completely different materials. Um, and so uh, when you try and uh, play uh, and, and uh, not mess up, but, but uh, try and tweak the chemistry, uh, you start to uh, eat up in other parts of what a battery can do. It, it becomes a little less safe. Um, and uh, those sort of uh, balancing um, uh, the technology side and, uh, and the safety side uh, has been a, a crucial part of the industry. Um, can you tell me a little more about these fires? There have been fires not just in, yeah. in Tesla cars, but uh, in energy storage applications in South Korea yeah. uh, in the last year, which has sort of shaken up the, the industry a little bit. Yeah. Um, so from an energy storage perspective, um, South Korea was one of the biggest markets that saw a huge number of deployments last year. Um, uh, because of the incentive program that was introduced by the government in South Korea, we saw a lot of projects um, sort of getting quickly deployed in the country. Um, and just because of a lot of inexperience of developers and you know people really trying to package these systems and not citing them properly and not having a proper standard safety standard in place, a lot of these systems actually caught fire. Um, so far, we've heard there have actually been more than 21 fires um, across different facilities that were deployed last year. So that's a big number, and, and especially for the energy storage industry because it's a fairly nascent industry and it's still ramping up. So that's definitely raised huge concerns in the market. And just a few weeks ago, um, there was a big fire in Arizona. Um, so a facility which was um, under owned by APS um, was um, ended up catching fire again. Uh, investigations are still ongoing, you know, whether it was a problem at battery cell level or whether there was a problem, you know, with the inverter of the system, whether there was a problem with the fire suppression system that was in place. Um, so investigations are still ongoing, but uh, not to say, you know, this definitely has brought a lot of concerns in the market that we need to make sure that these uh, systems that are being built are built to, you know, the best standards. We are ensuring that there is, you know, adequate safety, there are adequate fire suppression and detection systems uh, functioning within these um, battery systems. And the other uh, side of the equation is you've got energy and safety, but there's also a third one, which is power. So the difference being how quickly you can withdraw power, uh, withdraw energy from uh, from a battery, and that's crucial for uh, for electric cars, not just so that you can drive a fast car, everyone would like that, but also that you can f uh, charge them very quickly. And you, I'm sure you've all come across these sorts of claims that people have made that we'll make a battery equivalent to going into a gas station and filling up gas, uh, you know, five minute charge batteries. None of these are real at a commercial level today. Uh, and there are very good reasons for that. And I, you know, uh, Venkat has taught me a lot about why that's the case and, and you should explain that. Yeah, so um, uh, basically physics is in your way when you try to do anything fast. Um, <laughs> and. Um, and the one thing that we know is uh, you don't, uh, at least in my world, you don't violate second law of thermodynamics. Um, and so uh, the real challenge is when you want to try and do anything really fast, um, uh, there are all sorts of uh, heat uh, generation issues uh, that emerge. Uh, and um, the faster you try to do something, the more inefficient the system gets and the more heat you generate. So what you're doing is you're pumping an enormous amount of power and the system gets more and more inefficient so you, not only are you increasing the number itself, but you're also increasing the inefficiency. So you're doubly increasing the amount of heat generated. Uh, and so uh, that's really sort of at the heart one of the major issues when you try and develop fast charging technologies. Uh, and an associated uh, close issue with this is fast discharge, which actually will be important if you want to uh, go to things like flying cars and so on. And so b both have this sort of heat generation issue. And then the second one is, um, is really safety, uh, especially when you charge fast. Um, you 
aggravate all the things that lead to fire. Um, you have these uh, sort of filament-like structures, uh, much like snowflakes that form. Uh, they're called dendrites, uh, much like the dendrites that come um, when, um, when you see snow melting. Um, uh, and uh, those, essentially, what happens is it, it penetrates through from the anode to the cathode, touches it, uh, there's a short circuit, uh, there's heat released. But really, that's not what causes fire. The, the fire really comes from the fact that the cathode, uh, the nickel, manganese, cobalt, or whatever, has oxygen. That releases oxygen, and that's the trigger. Once the oxygen comes out, then you have oxygen, and possibly one of the best combustible substances, which is the electrolyte. Yeah. And uh, that's what uh, causes this sort of catastrophic failure. As it turns out, and, and you know, don't try this at home, but it's extraordinarily easy to take a cell and get it to catch on fire. Like It's like the easiest thing to do. Right? All you need to do is to tamper with the charging control and allow the voltage to go up uh, about what is the specified limit. It's extraordinarily easy to, to get a cell to catch on fire. So what we have to do to keep it safe is extremely difficult, and it has taken some phenomenal engineering uh, by EVs to keep the battery pack, which now has 8,000 of these cells, um, safe. And, and so uh, it's an extraordinary engineering feat to keep all of these battery cells uh, safe under the voltage window that, that should work. Uh, and so this is why be extraordinarily careful with uh, the, the, I guess, now millions of products that use lithium ion, uh, including those that you're going to keep in your ears with ear pods and um, I guess those that now you will have on your feet with like all these uh, scooters and uh, hoverboards and, and, and so on. So uh, just have that thought when you, when you put lithium ion anywhere close to your body. This is, this is the reason why uh, uh, on planes you're constantly reminded about how and where you should keep your lithium ion batteries. I have a question in the audience there. Uh, could you just introduce yourself and, and uh, uh, keep your question short? Thank you. Uh, Henry Hetker, retired government. I wondered, uh, w what is the source of the oxygen that causes this fire? Is there a nickel oxide in the compound uh, for the battery, or yeah. is it just the atmosphere? No, no, no. So the cathode has, so the only way you store, the, store w the way to store energy is lithium has to like being in the cathode, and lithium is positive, so it likes things that are negative. Mm -hmm. And so you need the oxygen to, uh, the lithium oxygen bond is what gives you the energy. And the reason you need nickel, manganese, and cobalt is if you just had lithium and oxygen, that, that doesn't, that's, uh, that's a very unstable compound. So the nickel, manganese, and cobalt is there to keep the material stable. So the energy producing component is really the lithium and the oxygen. Uh, and so the oxygen is there in the cathode. Um, and we have a question here. Thank you, uh, David Livingston. Again, two questions, actually. Um, zooming out a little bit from the chemistry and, and uh, helping to frame a little bit some of the, you know, the geography of this and why we're seeing the trends that we see. It struck me you've got, you, you have only East Asian players uh, of the five largest players that you showed. What's interesting there, though, is that they're, they're very different economies. Some have extremely high labor costs. Some have much lower labor costs. Uh, they're different in terms of their geography, you know, uh, to some degree different in their industrial model. Why is it, do you think, that there's been such a concentration of market power in, in East Asian uh, battery manufacturers, number one? And then following on from that, what sort of policy mechanisms support battery deployment? Is it the same as we see for solar or wind, uh, or do you need different sort of uh, policy incentive mechanisms? I'll give a little history and then I'll ask questions, which is, so the way lithium ion batteries were developed, a lot of the innovation happened here in the US. Uh, so the different components that we talked about that make the lithium ion battery work were, were developed here in the US. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know if uh, people are, are aware, but the first lithium based battery was developed by ExxonMobil. Well, Exxon when it was developed in the in the 70s, uh, and this is uh, during the oil crisis where uh, oil companies were worried about oil running out altogether, uh, and they wanted alternative energy, and they they uh, worked on these technologies. Of course, the oil oil glut came back, uh, and then they dropped uh, research in these spaces. The reason why Japan has uh, been a leader is because Japan was the first country to pull all those innovations from different parts of the world and develop uh, in Sony the first commercial lithium ion battery. And so they got a head start in this space because of the commercialization aspect. South Korea though, I am not sure. China I can talk a, li a little bit about, but uh, do, do, you, do either of you know why 
South Korea became a, a, a leader? No, not anything in particular in terms of technology. And I just want to add one, one point that um, Japan uh, and the UK were equally instrumental uh, in, the, in the original development of the lithium-ion uh, lithium battery. Uh, I think, I think w one could be market. I think the fact that um, portable uh, electronics revolution was largely uh, being driven by, by companies uh, in those countries. Um, and of course, um, uh, I think um, uh, the chemical industry also plays a, plays a big role. Uh, I think the fact that um, there was a very, very strong chemical industry uh, in, these, in these countries would have also played into the whole ecosystem around uh, making lithium ion batteries because it's just as much uh, a chemicals play as it is uh, a, a sort of product play. And I mean, China um, itself has had its EV policy for a while now. Um, they've introduced um, incentives in order to ensure that, you know, um, um, local manufacturing is getting like, more and more subsidies. Uh, though I will point out one thing is the way uh, Chinese EV, EV policy started, they actually were supporting a different kind of battery chemistry back then, which is lithium iron phosphate. That's again another SEP chemistry within the lithium ion family of batteries. Um, so China originally started with uh, providing a lot of subsidies and incentives to local manufacturing and building a lot more on LFP batteries. Um, LFP batteries are less energy dense than um, nickel manganese cobalt batteries. Um, most of the LFP batteries that were um, being manufactured in China back um, again like three or four years ago were mostly being deployed for e-trucks, e-buses, um, and some for energy storage applications as well. Um, but over years, um, Chinese government has kind of revised their policy, and as of last year, they ended up um, increasing the energy density um, under which the batteries would qualify for um, incentives. So as a result of that, now vendors are shifting towards you know looking at again nickel manganese cobalt batteries. Um, the other thing that I also want to mention is um, last year was again an interesting year for energy storage space. Um, so while there is this huge demand that is coming from the EV industry, energy storage industry is kind of riding on the cost curve of EVs at the moment. Uh, but last year what happened because of the South Korean market where we saw huge deployments happening and then LG and Samsung were primarily just supplying to the domestic market, global market actually felt a supply shortage. Uh, for uh, batteries for energy storage or grid applications. Um, US was hit the hardest because vendors just couldn't get a hold of batteries from you know, these Asian vendors um, last year. Uh, so what started happening was um, uh, vendors here in the US started sourcing batteries from China, and so we actually saw a huge interest in LFP batteries for grid storage applications last year. And um, this is one of the trends that we expect to continue even this year and next year, where we will see some divergence in energy storage space from EVs where we'll see a lot more um, LFP or lithium iron phosphate application in energy storage industry. Yeah, and these policies can have uh, a huge impact on how, how corporations behave. So uh, Panasonic and Tesla, for example, had a, a sort of monogamous relationship until earlier this year when Tesla moved to uh, uh, start a gigafactory in China. And because it would also want to be able to qualify for subsidies that all electric cars are getting, <laughs> it needs to buy a Chinese domestic uh, company uh, made uh, battery. And so now they are open to uh, sourcing their batteries, not just from Panasonic, but from everybody. Uh, we have a question there. Dick Morningstar, chairman of the Global Energy Center. Uh, following up on David's question on the different economies in Asia, um, as luck would have it, I was changing a lithium battery last night in my car key. Uh, and it turns out that this lithium battery is made in Indonesia. Um, is, is the same thing happening in Asia that has happened in industries in the U.S. where manufacturing gets shifted to different regions in the country or to Mexico or wherever? And so cheap labor in a place like Indonesia, do they end up being a primary manufacturer or where the technology may be in other places? Um, so the battery you're probably talking about is a is either a non-rechargeable battery or is one of those uh, single-use batteries. Is that right? Or is it a button cell or...? Yeah. yeah. Cell. So those are those are uh, those are batteries that are a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the market. So you know the brands we think about Duracell or EverReady or uh, these or these button cells are uh, you know they might get manufactured in India or in Indonesia or uh, in South Africa, but those don't really count into the space that we are talking about right now, which is lithium-ion technologies. 
And having been to CATL, which is the largest uh, battery factory, and a few others actually, the amount of automation in there is phenomenal. Uh, so that place had 15,000 employees, but you, uh, but that's a big number, but the number of employees within the factories were far and few. Uh, there were long corridors uh, all the way to the horizon, and you had five people in, in those cor corridors. So uh, automation has already come to uh, this space, and it's not tied to the labor um, um, costs that, that David uh, picked on. I would just add one, one point to that. Um, I think um, it will happen uh, in, in segments. And I think you should ask the question uh, why China was able to successfully start lithium ion phosphate. Right? There's so much lithium ion phosphate in, produced in China. Uh, and the reason is because it's easy to do. Right? The chemistry was not complicated. Uh, it was inherently safe, much safer to, it's very hard to pull out the oxygen out of the iron phosphate. So it was an inherently safer chemistry to handle. So you didn't need to get it right uh, to make something that was 90% good, and 90% good was still very good. Uh, and the sort of safety challenges were not as big. So I would guess that many of these sort of easier chemistries uh, will become ubiquitous. Everyone will be able to make it. Uh, and, and then I think we will see this where you know, ev pretty much everyone should have uh, their own supply of lithium ion cells for their own market and other markets. So I think it will be very easy uh, for lithium ion plants to spin up now. I think that the technology is there. The know-how is now widely prevalent all over the world for many chemistries. I think this, the sort of premium cutting edge, you know, whether you have 80% of nickel or 60% of nickel, that's still sort of, there's still more science and art to that. Uh, but for the sort of commodity chemistries, and there are many commodity chemistries in the lithium ion family that are maybe 80% as good as the sort of best. And I think those will become easy for everyone to make. The other thing I would say, and I'll come to that question, uh, is that economies of scale uh, operate in these technologies that uh, are must be appreciated. So, and this is not just true of batteries, but also uh, of solar photo photovoltaics. So China is also the leader in, in making solar cells. And the, the way it works is if you have a large, uh, if, you, uh, if you lay out a large uh, factory, you're able to source your uh, machinery at a lower cost you're able to automate it more, and all those add up to the curve that we saw of how battery prices are falling down. And so having large factories is one way to do it, and that's another reason why China, uh, you know, having these incentives and also direct subsidies. So a lot of uh, Chinese states have provided, you know, uh, either free land or, or, uh, or uh, no taxes on the land that they're giving, um, and, and those are incentives that are playing uh, into uh, having these large factories and why China is the leader in this space. Uh, Phyllis Yoshida, Sasakawa USA, retired DOE. In the late 90s, uh, we were writing analyses when we were running the Partnership for a New Generation of Vehicles about the economic and national security aspects of not having any lithium ion manufacturing in the US. And I know we did things to try to encourage some of that, but when I look at your list and I <laughs> listen to the discussion that just happened, it doesn't seem to be happening. So what are the prospects for us rebuilding a domestic industry? Yeah, there's a little bit of a historical point between that mm -hmm. where, uh, of course, the financial crisis brought, it, brought with it this uh, stimulus package uh, where some of the money was deployed to try and bring in lithium ion manufacturing space here uh, in in US. Uh, some of the money went to LG uh, uh, in, in creation of a factory, I think, in Michigan. Uh, and some of that money went to A123, which is a US company at the time, was developed by uh, the, the uh, technology was based out of MIT. Um, the story is that A123 went bankrupt and then got bought by a Chinese company. And so that technology moved to China. And so that's also happened. But I think that's a very good question. Uh, you know, lithium ion is back into the space because of Panasonic and Tesla. But what is the future for I, I lithium ion manufacturing? I think economically it, it will happen uh, everywhere, actually, because uh, the cost, if you look at now the, the overall cost per kilowatt hour of the battery pack, transporting the battery is actually a non-trivial fraction of the cost now, given the materials have been squeezed. I, I think it will be important for everyone to make their cells locally. Um, and, and so I think that's one of the reasons why this integrated approach of Tesla making the Gigafactory at the top floor with Panasonic making the cells, and then the 
modules coming down uh, and then them integrating that with the, the motor and the uh, power electronics. I think it has to be that way because if you, if you have to, you know, and as we've seen with challenges being able to ship cars made in California to elsewhere, I think the, the, the transportation cost will become non-trivial. So uh, I, think th I think the factories have to now be integrated if it has to hit the 30, below 30K, 25K target uh, for cars. So I think there will be lithium-ion manufacturing everywhere. Um, it has to happen. I would yeah. say, though, that is dependent on having the demand for electric cars. Yeah. So if, if there are no incentives to create that demand here in the US, that may not become a reality at the scale that you know, we expect it to. Uh, Europe is going through some of that challenge right now. Um, you've got uh, you know, France and Germany coming up with this battery alliance, pouring in a, a billion euros to try and bring local manufacturing uh, capacity. But of course, at that, the same time, you have a Chinese company in CATL uh, creating a battery factory in, in Germany. So you're going to get this reverse um, uh, a, a technology play where the Chinese bought some US technology and are now going into Europe with that technology. Um, yeah. Sorry. Just Hi, Chris Troy from Power Africa. So for, for our program, we've been supporting uh, energy development across Africa, and then solar is one of those that we support heavily. And then there's been a movement to look at solar plus storage because just supporting solar, it, it ends up that the US was not very competitive with the solar panels. But then if you add in storage, then there, there were or are still some competitive sources for the, for the storage. But it sounds like you guys are telling you know, some interesting um, stories and some data showing that may not be going in that, in that direction. So which, which chemistry currently dominates for a stationary thing, so you don't need like, you know, density for like a, a, you know, for a car, but for energy storage. So which, which chemistry dominates for that? And then which geographies are really dominating in their growth rates of, of development? Yeah, um, sure. So in terms of chemistry, um, as I mentioned, nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries are pretty much dominating um, the market um, globally as well as in the US. But as I mentioned earlier, we are seeing this increased interest in LFP, um, lithium iron phosphate batteries, just because of the whole demand and supply situation. Um, the market already saw a huge shortage of um, batteries last year, um, nickel, manganese, cobalt batteries. Um, and so the LFP vendors, iron phosphate vendors, started tapping into these um, um, nickel, manganese, cobalt cons um, supply constraint markets. The other thing that um, also led to a huge interest in um, iron phosphate batteries was pricing. So last year, just because, um, again, South Korea, huge demand, um, EVs are a huge demand of, you know, uh, are taking up a huge demand uh, of batteries. So uh, we saw huge increases in uh, nickel, manganese, cobalt pricing last year for energy storage, not for EVs, but just specifically for energy storage applications. Again, markets outside Asia. Uh, and that's again why um, lithium iron phosphate vendors started selling in at very competitive pricing. Traditionally, iron, lithium iron phosphate batteries used to be expensive than nickel manganese cobalt, but last year they were actually fairly competitive to nickel manganese cobalt, price, uh, cobalt um, battery pricing. So as a result of that, we saw huge interest again in um, iron phosphate batteries. The third reason why there was a huge interest is fire safety. So as I mentioned, you know, fire safety is becoming a priority for the energy storage applications more and more every day. Um, it's really important to build these, you know, systems safe to ensure that, you know, you can site them in locations like New York City where, you know, we have some of the hard, some of the most stringent requirements um, around fire codes. So we need to ensure that these systems are safe to be deployed and populated and in urban centers. Um, so that's another reason why there is, again, a huge interest in lithium iron phosphate batteries um, uh, as well. And uh, a little bit on the geographies. I mean, I, I live in the UK, and uh, there have been incentives for energy storage, but nowhere close to the sorts of in incentives that come out of, say, Australia uh, or South Korea. Yeah. Uh, um, what, what are the geographies where energy storage applications, where you're trying to combine some of the renewables? Yeah. Um, uh, what, what are those, which countries are leading yeah. there? I mean, US is obviously one of the most mature markets um, in terms of energy storage applications. We've had mandates, regulatory support, um, incentives. Um, different states have announced, you know, storage targets that they're trying to get to. Um, again, huge renewable penetration in the US, so we're seeing a lot more solar and storage getting deployed. Um, so that's one of the biggest markets. Um, South Korea emerged um, as a big market last year. Again, incentives that were provided by the government, um, more around you know um, pairing your storage with solar or with wind. 
Um, Australia again has seen again um, huge deployments as a result of um, huge renewable penetration um, in that market as well. China, interestingly enough, has also started focusing a lot more on energy storage, um, specifically battery energy storage. Um, until a few years ago, they were more uh, focused on pumped hydro and other storage technologies, but now they're looking very specifically at building more um, energy storage as well. So that's another um, interesting market that we're looking at. In Europe, um, UK and Germany, I would say, are the two markets that have showed uh, a lot of um, energy storage um, applications. UK specifically doesn't have any incentives. Uh, but it's more market driven, so it's more um, applications that you know vendors are trying to target, like frequency regulation, ancillary services. In Germany, we've seen actually a lot more behind the meter storage, so more residential storage. Um, so people are again, you know, um, citing their batteries along with their solar uh, for resiliency needs, for backup power, to ensure that they're time shifting their solar. Yeah, and these sort of batteries are also becoming uh, are getting used to do new things. So after after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Uh, some of the islands are now uh, are, are mini grids. So yeah. rather than being connected to the main island uh, through these undersea cables, which uh, get ruined in, 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 in such catastrophes, they are now, uh, they have solar plus batteries uh, on their own island and they don't, they don't need to be connected to the main island. So that's starting to happen in places. In the UK and in the UAE, both places, uh, I've, uh, I've written stories about something called a virtual power plant. So you take batteries in thousands of homes and you connect them together, you get permission from each of those, of course, and then you use that because they are all stores of energy as a power plant because that's the scale at which you can deploy them. Um, and those, those applications are going to start to eat into natural gas power plants because a lot of natural gas power plants in the UK, US and, and generally around the world are used for peak uh, demand. So when, when at 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. you have a huge increase in people using um, uh, electrical uh, devices or electricity in general, uh, these power plants come on board and solar plus storage and batteries are going to start into eating into that and cut greenhouse gas emissions, but also this is becoming an economical yeah. uh, approach for them. Um, you know, there are a few questions. One here, take one, and then after that. Um, just a quick question on the, uh, the, the point at which um, battery deployment, energy storage deployment might start to cannibalize its own business model. So if you think about the style, you know, a, a highly stylized model of, of, of the, you know, the, the kind of the business proposition for batteries is it's an arbitrage between price, you know, a, a high price and a low price over the course of a day or, a, you know, whatever the, the time period might be. Um, it, the more of these that are deployed, the more you whittle away at, at that arbitrage opportunity, the more you, you smooth out prices over the day uh, rather than having peaks and valleys. What are, what are different players in the industry uh, doing to, to anticipate that sort of trend? Uh, and and what, are the, what does that tell us as well about the way that we design policy going forward if we want to see continued growth for batteries? a great question. I don't think industry has already reached that point that we are um, kind of already fearing from, you know, that we'll have a lot more deployments and we won't be able to see any growth in the future. Um, one of the things that's definitely happening in the industry is um, value stacking. So your batteries can not only just provide for one use case application or for just one revenue stream, but vendors are trying to build systems where they can actually um, use a particular battery system for several app, for several um, use case scenarios and can derive several value streams out of it. So you can use your battery system not only for, um, you know, your behind the meter battery system, not only for providing resiliency or backup power, but it can also be used to provide for grid services. So, you know, your utility can actually tap into your battery system during a peak event um, and uh, you can uh, be a part of a demand response program and you can actually get incentives from the utility as well along with you know that battery providing power to you as well as you know helping um, time shift your solar application so a lot of those models are currently being developed um, it's still a matter of time that you know the industry figures out a way that they can actually value stack different revenue streams um, but um, as, as the industry matures we'll definitely you know see the market moving towards that there's also that's happening at the same time as the costs of batteries are going yeah. down so right now you're not feeling the, the question you you've raised is a very good one and it's a valid one but we are not feeling that uh, play out as 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 it would in a few years time there's also the question that uh, that can only play for a certain amount of time this is few hours of application batteries can't store energy f over seasons so you know in in the UK we consume a lot more energy in the winter than we consume in the summer and lithium-ion batteries not set for that so those are technologies that we still need to develop and and, and scale up there's a question here 
I'm uh, Bill Stetson. I'm a non-resident senior fellow here. I'm a trustee at the Smith Richardson Foundation. And uh, in the 90s, I was a um, consultant to General Motors for new, uh, new automotive, uh, their, all their ideas. And there were many ideas. We rented half of Central Park one day and drove all these cars around. And uh, I don't know what it amounted to, but it was a fun day. <laughs> um, so I love analyzing what car companies are promising and what actually results. Now, the Volkswagen group is in some trouble, and they're trying to dig out uh, through uh, a variety of EV technology. They're promising 24 new models throughout the three uh, companies, uh, from VW to Porsche, and uh, with tremendous uh, supercharging ability, uh, tremendous range, and I'm just wondering, what do you think is going to happen in the real world? Uh, I have a Tesla now, and believe me, at 10 degrees in northern New England, there is no range. <laughs> so I, I'll let Venkat take this, but I'm going to uh, say that Venkat, uh, one of the things that uh, the question you've raised is essentially every new electric car that's coming on online, uh, Venkat does this analysis of what a battery can do for the car. Uh, and then he sends that analysis to me, and then I write a story about it, and uh, I've categorized those stories that, as battery police. So he sort of takes the battery and figures out whether they can do all the, the large claims uh, that yeah, know, so, um, people are throwing. Yeah, so um, we, we, I, I think it's a very important question um, of um, what is possible. Uh, and, and you bring up two, two, two important effects. One is cold weather um, and uh, fast charging. Um, I think fast charging is gotten to the point now where I think it's pretty credible if anyone says you can charge um, zero to eighty percent in fifteen minutes. Um, it is more than like may not be there like immediately, but it will get there. Uh, I think uh, if someone says zero to eighty percent uh, uh, in about fifteen to twenty minutes, um, I think we will get there. Um, the cold weather. Uh, is getting a lot better. Uh, the, one of the beautiful things about batteries is that they're inefficient, but then that means that when it's cold, uh, it heats up automatically. So one of the things that happens actually when uh, it is uh, minus 20 outside, like it is in Pittsburgh frequently, and I also drive a uh, Model S, uh, the range is half. Um, and they've been getting better and better at managing the thermals. It's all about making sure the battery heats up to where it wants to be, just like humans, right? They wants to be in this beautiful air conditioned 25 degrees Celsius environment. When it puts out peak power, it doesn't have any sort of perturbation. So the higher it goes, then you know cycle life fade happens. So uh, people are figuring out thermal management issues. So uh, I would say with high confidence that in the next two years, uh, you can easily buy cars that have well over 300 mile range, uh, probably at a price point somewhere between 30 and 40K uh, with a charging time of 15 minutes uh, for passenger sedans, okay? But that doesn't mean anything uh, in North America because 70% of the market is SUVs and pickup trucks, okay? So which means that uh, that's only a small sliver of the market. And so for pickup trucks, uh, roughly a pickup truck is twice as inefficient as a, as a sedan. What that means is that uh, now double the battery pack cost so the average price point that you can enter with a pickup truck today uh, is somewhere around 50 to 60K. Uh, that would be somewhat competitive with like the Ford F-150, which of course still holds the title of the best selling car in North America. Um, and so I think it's very, uh, I think sedan is a solved problem, um, which is why I don't do any research on sedan. Sedans is done. Um, and uh, the hard part is pickup trucks uh, and then long haul, long haul trucking. I think that's an extraordinarily hard problem. There, it's a fundamental value proposition because any weight you have in the battery pack is weight you can't carry as payload, and the value proposition is how much weight you move from point A to point B. So trucks is very, very hard. Last really hard problem is, is planes. But, uh, but in terms of uh, automotives, I think you know, many of the, these things, um, I think uh, from the 1996 GM days, I think we've come, a, we've come a very long way. Uh, I think at this point, quite easy. There are uh, lots of questions. So there are a few uh, at the back. OK, I'm going to take that one. And then there's a question here uh, on this side. I'll take yours. Good afternoon. Doug McClellan, McTriton Engineering. Um, there's also been a wild card factor in the lithium problem. We know that it's hard to get the volumes out, get the production up, and whatnot. And slow and behold, I've watched this grow slowly more and more. And that is the factor of the supercapacitor, supercap. 
When these things starts augmenting the, the lithium battery packs, it cuts the weight down radically, as well as augment and becomes a sort of powerful. As an engineer, we used to laugh at that this thing, you know, we said, you can't do this. When I started seeing vehicles driving down the street with no batteries, I said, wait a minute. So what do you see this as the impact on in the foreign supply and manufacturing of these lithium batteries? Sorry, I'm not sure. The question was about supercapacitors or about lithium-ion batteries? Yeah, it's, it's about supercapacitors and their effect in being augmentation onto right. the lithium batteries, because that's where they're often yeah. doing. What they're doing is they're putting them in parallel. Yeah. So, so and it, it smooths out. It, it, yeah. Think of it like a battery multiplier. Yeah. It multiplies the effect of the lithium. For when it needs a surge of energy, it can do it without tearing you to the battery, and therefore you can cut down the number of batteries yeah. and weight in the vehicle. You should explain yeah. the, the uh, yeah, explain so capacitors yeah, before so, we. So let me just proceed. quickly explain capacitors and, and, and batteries. Uh, uh, batteries are uh, are a form of uh, chemical energy storage. So you move uh, chemicals. Uh, the beauty about supercapacitors is, is is completely electrical. So you just move charge. Uh, and everything is stored in the electrostatic energy. Uh, and so as you rightly point out, that means that they can last like, you know, essentially forever um, compared to batteries. Um, capacitors and capacitors are, are right now in your phones. Like they are there in every piece of electronics you can see, uh, even more so than batteries, but they are used for very specific applications. Yeah, so those are, those are capacitors. I think the things that, uh, that you mentioned are supercapacitors, which are basically a, a subclass of materials. Um, uh, the, there is a, there's, uh, there's going to be uh, definitely an important role for supercapacitors to play. Uh, the, the thing that they're very good at is delivering a lot of power. They're not as very good uh, at delivering a lot of energy. Uh, so they're very voluminous and heavy uh, for delivering energy. So you would not use them as the primary energy source, but you could use them as a uh, way to augment this. This will be extremely important actually in uh, markets where you need uh, high power. Um, so things like uh, power tools and things like that where you need very high power. Uh, there, actually, there's a very important role for supercapacitors to play. Uh, one that's my personal favorite is flying cars. Uh, there, it actually is extraordinarily important because for takeoff, you need a very high amount of power. Uh, so, um, so there are there are markets where this will become uh, very important, and uh, it's about managing the engineering of when you use the supercapacitor and the battery, which we're getting better at. So, it's important. There's a question back there. Hi, Elena McGovern, AT Carney. Um, my question is about um, cobalt again. You mentioned it a little bit in the beginning and some of the supply chain issues. There's growing attention to some of the political and ethical issues around these supply chains. Um, and a couple interesting data points recently. The London Metals Exchange said that it was going to start delisting companies in 2022 that don't follow clean and ethical standards. That's, you know, that has the DRC cobalt mines, you know, right in their target. BMW has said it's intentionally going to be starting to source EVs, you know, from other countries to not deal with child labor. Um, and I think it was just two weeks ago that Tesla, in a closed door meeting, someone said that Tesla expects there to be a tech metal supply shortage in the next couple years. I mean, it was very soon. Um, so I just want to get your views on, you know, what is the outlook for the cobalt market, um, new sources of supply, how you said prices even doubled from last year to this year. You know, what are, we, what are we looking at? And especially as some of these political risks and companies are increasingly having to demonstrate that they have what we call, you know, clean supply chains. Um, I'll let uh, Mitali take that answer, but I'll give a historical point here, which has been one that lots of academics have made to me every time I've asked this question, which is there has been no material that we've really ever run out of. Um, and that's because economics of elements are such that when you start uh, hitting constraints of cost constraints, essentially, uh, we move to something else that works. Um, and so, sure, cobalt is the, is the super cop here, uh, and we might find a, a, a cobalt alternative at some point, but that is the historical point. We've never run out of something that we really need for whatever our application demand has been. Um, and just to kind of um, go back to the point that I was mentioning earlier, like last year we saw prices of cobalt more than double, but this year actually prices have stayed flat. Prices have actually come down and they have stayed flat early this year. We haven't seen any increase in cobalt prices up, to, up until now. They might, might start increasing again, but uh, 
the and that's the way the industry is kind of working towards it, right? Um, as I mentioned earlier on, like industries also already looking at making sure that we are either having low cobalt cathodes or even working towards no cobalt in cathodes. So there are also some, you know, um, technical uh, advancements happening around where we can ensure that these batteries uh, completely eliminate cobalt. Um, one of the examples around that is. Um, vendors kind of looking at lithium sulfur batteries, um, again a technology which is still several years out, but there are you know uh, investments going on around that. Um, another kind of chemis another kind of battery type that um, several vendors are also looking at are solid state batteries, um, which is a kind of battery where your electrolyte would be. Um, uh, electrolytes usually are in, in liquid state right now, but you will actually have a more solid state electrolyte, which will actually increase energy density of your battery. Um, so those are also, you know, currently um, under innovation and vendors are trying to develop that. Uh, but at least in our forecast at WoodMac, we don't expect to hit a co uh, cobalt supply constraint anytime soon. Uh, we think that we have enough supply to, you know, meet the demand at least for the next five to seven years. The Just other to calibrate, yeah. the, the cobalt amounts are, are dropping drastically, yeah. right? So now it's about down to five kilograms per car, yeah. and it will probably get to like, you know, sub, sub two, two, three kilograms uh, per car. So, so I think it's, it's dropping dramatically. Right. The, the other thing to keep in mind is lead acid batteries are, uh, in at least the rich countries, mostly recycled. Yeah. And uh, we are, ve I mean, lead is a good material to recycle, so there's reason for that. Uh, but we've become really good at recycling uh, lead because it's cheaper to use recycled lead than, than, uh, than mined lead. Uh, and that's going to start happening in the cobalt, I mean, the, in just lithium ion industry in general, but uh, specifically looking at cobalt. So Audi uh, last year worked with Umicor, which is a, a metals company, uh, to uh, develop a technology to have essentially 95% of battery materials, valuable materials recycled. Yeah. And we are starting to see that play out on large scales in, in China, where now electric cars in the thousands uh, have been around for 10 years, and that's about uh, the life of a, a, a lithium ion battery uh, if it were just sitting around. And so recycling is starting to take off. So that's the other way in which we can overcome material constraints. The other thing that I'll add is, is uh, also kind of uh, banking onto what you said is, um, for energy storage applications, we're also hearing uh, bringing back um, EV batteries for second life applications in energy storage industry. So that's another thing that is being explored by um, grid storage vendors, uh, where they can actually bring back used EV batteries for grid storage applications, just repurpose them, because um, EV batteries still have a decent amount of cycle life left, so they can actually be deployed for energy storage applications. We just need to repurpose them. So that is also going to impact the demand of these batteries in the future and bring down pricing in the future. And, and overall impact, you know, the raw materials that we'll need. There were, there were a few questions that have been ha raised hands over there that have not gotten to. So I'll get to one over there, and then I'll come back to oh, one here. So that one. Yep. Some years ago when electric cars were, were still ramping up, there was a lot of talk about having uh, networks of charging stations. And I was thinking that with the issue of recharging speed and, and the increased danger that goes with that, um, has anyone looked at uh, the idea of just taking the battery out rather than recharging the battery yeah. in the car? Yeah, that's so a good question. Uh, and the battery swapping technology, what you're referring to is battery swapping technology. Lots of people have tried it. Well, to, I mean, the, the famous examples is, you know, Tesla uh, developed uh, 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 the ability to try and swap out batteries in the Model S. Uh, then you know, did not go down that route and, and abandoned it. Uh, there was a spectacular failure of a startup called Better Energy. Be better Place. Better Place, uh, which was an Israeli startup that got to a billion dollar valuation at some point and, and then uh, failed to take off. And it's, it's an economics question yeah, because it's, it's you a very simple It's a very simple calculation. Uh, each battery pack is now not, you, you have to own more than one battery pack for you to uh, to ba basically be able to go right because uh, so essentially now the cost now becomes 1.5 times the battery pack cost and battery pack is still 50 percent of the vehicle cost or 40 to 50 percent of the vehicle cost so uh, it basically bumps up the cost far too much however in markets where uh, where this is not the case for example uh, in two wheelers and and uh, three wheelers um, there's actually a real important play for for um, uh, for battery swapping where you need to be on the move all the time. So there's an important uh, place there, but I think it's very unlikely that this will happen in automotive, but it will happen in trucking, where uh, trucking is basically fleet owned. So there, there's a fleet 
angle to it. So if you have a fleet of vehicles, then it actually makes economic sense to do swapping. So fleets and, and two wheelers will see swapping. Every other market, no swapping. And, and swapping is currently in use in India in two wheelers and three wheelers. So three wheelers are, are famous uh, in India and, and, uh, and Southeast Asia. And they are actually using those technologies right now. So battery swapping stations are being built in, in Mumbai and Delhi. Uh, China is still trying automotive. So there are uh, two car companies uh, in China, NIO uh, and BJEV, who are building out their own battery swapping stations. Uh, so the technology, you know, most technologies don't die. There might be some use, ap use case application, but yeah, yeah, Venkat's right. It, it doesn't seem like it's going to be a, a mass market. Uh, so th this is the one way. thing in the in the in the battery business is almost like a religion. There are those that believe in swapping and those that don't, <laughs> and and it, it's, it's impossible to convince one, one side or another side. All right, there are questions here. Uh, there's one in the back that's being raised. Uh, so I'll take that one and take yours and yours. Yeah, thank you for your insights. Um, my name is Ravi Deepak with Science and Technology Corporation. And when you look into uh, like the history of lithium ion, it seemed like when I digested the market, it was like laptops, cell phones, and Tesla sort of led to like the institutional investment into this technology. But when's the phase shift to like hydrogen or other like battery storage uh, technologies? And especially when you look at emerging markets where institutional investments haven't been made such as India or other places, do you think these technologies can take, uh, take strongholds? Yeah, um, I would just correct that by saying uh, it's uh, um, laptops, smartphones, and then electric cars, not Tesla. Oh. That's a Western uh, <laughs> viewpoint that we need to correct because honestly, the, the place that where electric cars are taking off uh, is, is China. Yeah. Not, you know, yeah. Tesla is the one that we know here because it's, it's in our faces and we have a CEO who is in our faces all the time, but but the real the real the real players are in China. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I think that's a good question. So, so hyd hydrogen has uh, actually I would say hydrogen had uh, just as much or even more investment than than batteries over the last thirty years, uh, and uh, we've but research not in, in in not in the startup space. Well, for good reason. Um, <laughs> so. Um, uh, so hydrogen fuel cells, uh, uh, Japan is one uh, country that has pushed it enormously. H Honda and Toyota have uh, invested an enormous amount of money in building uh, fuel cells um, for uh, automotive um, and stationary power. Uh, the challenge with hydrogen is every part about it is, is, is problematic. Making hydrogen is hard, storing hydrogen is hard, using hydrogen is hard. Um, so uh, we still haven't figured out efficient ways to store it. Um, you don't want to store it in a as, as, hydro, as compressed hydrogen. Uh, so there are safety challenges associated with that, but there are some solid state materials. People have spent a lot of time trying to make that work. Uh, it has still not come to the state where uh, it's anywhere near uh, prime time to compete with lithium ion for automotive. I think that ship has sailed. Uh, maybe it might be possible to, do, uh, to, have a, to make a dent in trucking and aviation. I think it, it, their weight is actually super important their hydrogen uh, can play in a very important role. Uh, but I think for cars, it's probably the ship has sailed. Um, and the smirk that you saw on his face a little bit was because he used to be a fuel cell uh, researcher before, and he's a convert. So if, when he's saying that, I think you should believe why, <laughs> why the future for automotive applications uh, uh, is batteries. Uh, and you can, you can nerd out about him why so many battery researchers are fuel cell researchers and, and vice versa at some point. Uh, there was a question here which has been there for a while, so the uh, lady in the fourth row, um, and, and then. Um, okay. Is this on? Yeah. Hi, my name is Kay Kaufman. I'm with Fluence Energy, where in fact we are thinking about what happens to the uh, storage when markets change and uh, things like frequency response markets bottom out. We are thinking about it very hard, as a matter of fact. Um, and so the move towards long duration batteries, mm -hmm. particularly, um, you know, is also provides a lot of flexibility. And um, obviously, you know, there are issues of contracting. You know, we know the market is going to change, and storage companies are going to have to be flexible when, you know, a market that they have a customer in changes and they've got to figure out a way to keep the value of that storage. Um, one issue there 
is being, you know, with value stacking, is being able to monetize all those different streams, which is a regulatory issue, um, which we're certainly seeing in the United States and I think in Europe. I don't know if you can talk about that. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, uh, we are definitely not there yet where we are not seeing value stacking happening. Um, and I think more so when you think about pairing your storage with solar, where you can actually tap into a lot of revenue streams, that's definitely one of the challenges that we are seeing in the industry. Uh, but I think um, the way the market is looking at it is, is trying to overcome some of these issues as an industry together, where we can get to some of those um, results. The other way um, the market is also looking at tapping into different value streams is through the software layer. So a lot of advancements are happening where you know a lot of software vendors are trying to guarantee you where you can um, get into you know um, getting a lot more revenue streams and getting a lot more value out of your storage system. So that's also another thing that's happening in the market. But yeah, I mean for for the time being, it's definitely one of the challenges that we keep hearing a lot about, where the industry knows that the that you know we have all these revenue streams, but it's hard to tap into them. Uh, there's a question there. Hi, um, Julie. Um, I have just a question regarding to what was earlier discussed during this panel. Um, so you discussed that batteries, the, the production of batteries, should be located around the world and not be like monopolized at the moment in Asia. So I was just wondering if that would be the case. Would you expect that car manufacturers, and mostly European car manufacturers, would then take the battery production in-house because that for them would be a lot more expensive. So how would they then be able to sell their electric vehicles to consumers that already don't really want to pay the price for the electric vehicle? Thank you. Um, I can take that. Um, so one of the things with batteries and, and just car companies in general is that um, there, there are good reasons why startups like Tesla despite all uh, the difficulties and startups even in China are doing better than the, the traditional car company. Uh, that's because they are two different types of technologies altogether. You use electric motors to run electric cars. Uh, uh, you, you, know, you, you don't need uh, as many parts uh, in an electric car as you need in an, in an internal combustion engine car. And so something that uh, uh, the large car companies have tried to do is use the same platform that they were using for their old cars to then uh, make electric cars. And that's leading to uh, you know, inefficiencies and, and uh, poor, uh, 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 poor performance. Whereas when you come to it as a fresh uh, a start, uh, Tesla is an example, Rivian is the other example here in the US, uh, they're able to produce cars that are just better. Uh, and this has pro proven out over the last year. So uh, Venker did analysis with the two big electric cars that have come out, Jaguar I-Pace and Audi e-tron, you know, both from car companies that are loved uh, otherwise, and they've proven not to be able to do everything that uh, a car, car uh, an and electric that, car that, can do. That is largely due to the point that you just made. So that, that, let me just make maybe 30 seconds explain what, what it means to make a battery pack. So there are three aspects to it. You take a cell, and then you make it into a module, and then you could take the modules and make it into a pack. Uh, and so pretty much uh, um, everyone buys cells from someone else, um, or buys modules from someone else, or buys packs from someone else. Um, so it's a question of you know, what you buy. And what you buy gives you more engineering tunability. Uh, and so Tesla, on the other hand, Tesla make, buys their cells from Panasonic and then makes the modules, makes the pack. Uh, and that, that means that they understand everything from the module level. Um, other people uh, may buy modules, um, in which case they have only control from the module level, which means that you, you can't, uh, you can't um, engineer it to the point where you use all of the pack that is available. One of the, one of the interesting things we found out uh, in the analysis that we did on the Jaguar versus, um, uh, especially the Audi case, uh, Audi and Jaguar both uh, versus the Tesla case was, uh, they're leaving essentially 10% on the table. The, ba the energy is there in the battery pack, but they're not using it because uh, they're afraid that it will not last the, the cycle life that they're guaranteeing you. Uh, and so uh, many of these things stem from the fact that someone else is making some part of your value chain. Uh, I think it's going to be extraordinarily hard for all the automakers to turn into battery cell manufacturers. Uh, I think it is very, very unlikely uh, they will continue to buy cells from others. 
uh, but they think bringing more of the module engineering in-house uh, will be ex extremely important. Maybe bringing some cell engineering in-house, uh, but not making them themselves. I think that's probably the most likely scenario. Uh, that said, you know, people are going to try. So uh, Volkswagen has just announced this year, this week, that they are going to try and make uh, their own batteries. And so we'll see how it shakes out. But I think uh, think it's right on that. The question here. Our flow battery is looking for the electric grid. <laughs> this, uh, it took a while to come to flow batteries. Uh, I, this is clearly not a, an audience that loves batteries so much that flow batteries have not come. Um, I can answer, but I'll, do, do you have thoughts? Yeah, um, from an energy storage industry perspective, um, this is something that I always say. Um, flow batteries will start to make sense for niche applications. So as the market is looking at long duration systems, as was mentioned earlier, um, we are thinking about seasonal storage. We are thinking about using systems that are more than 10 hour duration systems. We want to cycle them more and more. We're looking at longer life, bigger projects. That's where um, we think that you know flow batteries are going to um, outperform lithium ion batteries. Because lithium ion batteries, the economics starts failing when you're looking at systems that are more than six hour duration. Um, that's when your lithium ion batteries don't perform really yeah, well. And it'd be fun to explain what flow batteries are because of the, the, the fact that they can, so flow batteries are really fun to think about because they are batteries that are unlike a battery that you know. So batteries are just these boxes of black, uh, black uh, plastic, usually outside and metals inside. Flow batteries have tanks with liquids in it and pumps. Uh, and, and what you essentially do is your, your energy is stored in these liquids, and then you use a, a smaller space to be able to convert that uh, energy into electricity uh, when you want it. And so you could keep uh, increasing the size of the tank and the pumps, and you can store more and more energy without having to uh, um, multiply the amount of battery, yeah. technical battery electrodes that you need. And that's why you're able to uh, get what you get scale. So you're able to sh store maybe you know, six hours worth of energy uh, at the same cost in, in theory as a lithium ion battery would be able to do it for an hour. But none of that has shaken out yet. Yeah. A, a flow battery really is a fuel cell, uh, <laughs> but it was not attractive <laughs> to call them fuel cells because DOE would not give us money if we called them uh, uh, fuel cells, <laughs> so we call them flow batteries. But really, it's, it's the exact same as a fuel cell. Yeah. You, have, you have a fuel and then you're flowing that through. Yeah. So. Um, I'll take a, there's, yeah, I'll take that question and uh, um, I'm going to come to Hi. future applications because I know there are some that I don't know if this has been covered earlier, but uh, Doug again. One promising technology is one of the things in batteries is what we call the positive electrode and it destroys fast. But in the case of iron batteries, it's been slow to develop and slow to get into yield of good production cost. However, one of their assets, do you see this increasing and getting better because they have tremendous longevity? I mean, in the, in the Ford Museum up in Detroit every year just for fun, they recharge the iron batteries in Thomas Edison's electric vehicle and drive it around the parking lot again. They've been doing this for 60 years. Do you see any increase in the volume in iron battery technology? I don't know what this iron battery yeah. technology is, and I think I've looked at pretty much every chemistry, so I'm not sure what this is. Not 100% sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I, sh I should. Uh, we we can if, look if at that it is later the case, at some that's point. That's a good first class in my in my battery scores. <laughs> yeah, there's a question here, and then I'm going to come to flying cars, because <laughs> Venkat told me they are going to become a reality. I don't believe him, <laughs> but we shall get to it. There's a question back. Uh, Thanks. Sonia Tigis with the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies. I was wondering if you could go just a little bit more into the recycling issue because I am, I mean, as cars are sort of traded internationally, I'm wondering if this is sort of increasingly going to become a problem, you know, if a battery is, is produced in one country and then sort of dissembled later on in another. Um, are there already any norms, like international standards, or is this something we're going to have to be looking into more in the future? Thank you. Maybe I'll, I'll offer some thoughts uh, on, on recycling and then you can, you can talk about the regulatory aspect. So uh, the volumes have not been there yet yeah. for people to really think about recycling, but it's actually pretty easy to recycle. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a little like bringing, uh, you know, it's like pumping some juice in back into the battery. So all you need to do is refresh the electrolyte that brings, back like, uh, brings you back 90% of where you were. So if you have an EV battery that, uh, that is degrading and you, you put some fresh electrolyte, 
uh, that brings you um, maybe you know 80 to 90 percent. There's now very good ideas around recycling cobalt uh, from the battery. The only thing you would recycle is cobalt. Everything else is not economically viable uh, to recycle. Uh, there are now ideas where you could take the one of the things that happens as the si cells age is the the size of the particle. Uh, that is there in the cathode increases. Uh, the size of the particle increases, it cannot deliver as much power. So all you have to do is uh, you know, do, the, do another processing step where you would then bring back the size uh, to the optimal size you would want it to. So there are uh, hydrothermal, other treatment technologies with which you can refresh back the cathode uh, itself. So uh, I think it's very likely, I mean, given what we've learned from lead acid and lead acid, recycling lead acid is a much harder problem than recycling lithium ion. So I think it's just that there was not, there's not volume, there was not resources. There's actually now a, a massive investment from DOE. They've now set up a yeah. facility in Argonne to, to, to uh, do uh, detailed research into recycling. I think it's actually not a, uh, it's, it's not nearly as hard a problem as trying to find like low cobalt alternatives. So I, I'm very optimistic that we would, we will be easily able to recycle. Yeah, and the on, the, on the regulations, I think you're right. Um, lead acid is harder to recycle, but because of regulations, we've also made it possible for the lead acid industry to get into recycling. Um, one of the things that I was surprised by in the last six months is that Europe put out uh, an, um, sort of a draft looking at how to um, encourage lithium ion battery recycling. And in that draft, they say, the kinds of regulations we are looking at, I'm rephrasing this, uh, are what are already in place in China. So uh, this is another you know, weird case where we are learning about regulations of an environmentally friendly way of using uh, technology from China these days. Um, and so I think you're absolutely right that without regulations, we're not going to be able to touch upon uh, uh, recycling. Okay, flying cars. Um, the last I talked to uh, experts, apart from you, about flying cars <laughs> was uh, they were considered magical. Uh, tell me why they're not going to be anymore. So uh, I, uh, uh, unlike Akshat, I don't write that many popular pieces, but I did write one popular piece in Conversation where we built an applet uh, where you could, uh, you could put your own uh, next generation futuristic battery chemistry and we'll tell you how long a, a realistic flying car would go. Um, and um, um, I think, um, so 2017 was when I, uh, when I made a massive shift in my research pro priorities and transitioned completely to, to flying cars, planes, and trucks. Uh, and because every, all of the markets seemed easy from, for, from a battery perspective. The hard part about flying cars is takeoff and landing, uh, especially for these EV dolls. Um, uh, not planes, planes actually landing is easy, but for EV dolls, flying uh, car type, I don't know if you've, you know, Flying cars is a funny, funny term, but basically what happens is uh, they in, in takeoff, they are in sort of a helicopter mode. Uh, so they're basically pushing the air up or down, uh, depending on whether you're going up or uh, uh, down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they tilt, uh, and then they go like a normal plane. So that's how um, uh, most designs of a flying car works. And so the hard part is when you take off and land, uh, you need to push an enormous amount of air. And, and so you have uh, a power requirement that is very, very high compared to the energy required during cruise. Uh, and so um, the challenge is how do you make batteries that are fast discharge capable? And this is a market that nobody cares about in the automotive, even Tesla, right? This is like asking uh, being on ludicrous mode for like a minute, right? So ludicrous mode for those of you that don't know is zero to 60 in two seconds or so. Uh, so you need to be in this same power delivery mode for about a few minutes if you have to take off and actually more importantly, a few minutes when you have to land. And it's because the landing and takeoff are essentially similar because for landing, you have to push all the air out uh, to land. And so it's essentially the same power requirement. And it's actually, as you know from your laptops, by the time it gets to 10%, you can play your YouTube videos and, and so on because delivering high power at, end, at low state of charge when the battery is nearly depleted is very hard. So that's the hard part. Um, so these are the two things that need to happen. So we need to be able to deliver fast, char fast discharge and uh, also be able to deliver that at, at low state of charge. So that's the, this is the hard part. But in terms of technology, with sort of near-term technology, we can build flying cars. Um, and we have ongoing projects with Airbus, uh, several other eVTOL companies. Um, and I think there's a straightforward way to get to things that can go about 40 to 50 mile range. Uh, and what Uber is thinking is you need to get about 100 uh, because you would want to do at least five trips, 20 miles. Um, 
and uh, at that point it would be uh, it would be uh, reasonable uh, because you can imagine after five trips you would recharge and, and so on so uh, I think uh, and and uh, you know I've, I've stuck my neck out in my uh, in my essay for uh, for TR35 I said in 2020 by 2025 I would have personally flown in a flying car uh, for a meaningful trip not a toy trip I mean like so so maybe like from uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon to Pittsburgh Airport, which is like 22 miles, 25 miles. So something like that, I think, is in the near future. This is the, we don't need like you know we don't need like 10 breakthroughs to get there. I think we will get there. So what about uh, what about planes? Exactly. <laughs> what about planes? Uh, planes are really really hard. Um, so uh, regional planes are doable. So things like uh, like a Pittsburgh to DC is maybe doable. Uh, the real planes is just very, very hard. Uh, anything beyond an Airbus A320, now we can't say Boeing 737, uh, but uh, uh, Airbus, beyond that sort of size, it's impossible. Um, and um, uh, probably things will go hybrid electric. Even if you go hybrid electric, I think you get a lot of the emission benefit. Um, but you know, jet engines are pretty efficient. Uh, they're 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 an amazing engineering feat, uh, and uh, the safety of batteries is not at the point where uh, I think one could uh, reliably use that. So I I I think a lot about planes. I, I work with a company that is trying to make hybrid electric planes for regional transport. I think regional is doable. Three hundred to five hundred mile five hundred nautical miles. Um, Ten to uh, you have to you have to do miles and passengers because it, it's a trade-off, uh, and so uh, I think you can do about twenty to fifty passengers uh, sub three hundred miles, uh, or tens of passengers for about five hundred miles. That's the limit of what this is the limit of what we know is possible with any chemistry. Right? I'm not I'm not I'm not constraining myself with what is possible today. This is with any chemistry in the known periodic table, unless we invent a new particle uh, with which we, uh, we shuttle between the anode and the cathode, so maybe an electron or maybe some other particle. But if we still use any ion, and it doesn't need to be lithium ion, it can be sodium ion, any ion, hydrogen, a proton, any of these things, um, this is basically the fundamental limit of what's possible. So planes are very, very hard. Yeah. Um, and with that, I think our time is going to come to a close. If you take something from this, I would say the battery hype is real, but to, to have that reality play out, you need to understand the details and you should not shy away from the details. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you, Venkat and Mithali and, and David and the Atlantic Council for hosting this.